All right. Thanks for your patience and welcome everybody. We are now live with another Blood Sugar Hotline broadcast, number five. And we're here with uh, some magic people. I'm gonna steal a line from my colleague, Leslie. Uh, magic uh, soul siblings, as she said. Um, we have some wonderful connections, but I'm gonna just introduce you each briefly and then we'll talk about some of those connections. Uh, Dr. Uma Pashardi, who is a pediatric gastroenterologist. And if you don't know what pediatric gastroenterology is, we're actually going to ask that question in a little bit. Uh, Leslie Lee Sutton, who is uh, a registered dietitian and uh, a metabolical warrior. And also Roberta Ruggiero, who's our founder and president of the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation. And she had the vision to start this organization over four decades ago, long before most doctors and healthcare providers had a clue about some of the issues related to metabolic health and especially uh, blood sugar. Um, and so, and then myself, Wolfram Alderson, I'm CEO of the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation. And um, I'm also a metabolic warrior and been in this business for the last four decades and uh, just really happy to be here today with my colleagues. Uh, we have some wonderful connections, as I mentioned. Uh, we, we're all connected to a doctor, another metabolic warrior named Dr. Robert Lustig. Um, he has a new book out uh, called Metabolical, and you can go to metabolical.com and read all about it. Um, he continues to be an inspiration to us, but we've also had some under, other wonderful connections. We've all been part of a couple of national uh, conferences, continuing medical education conferences focused on metabolic health and nutrition at Swedish Hospital in Seattle, where both uh, Dr. Pichardi and Leslie are based. And uh, we're uh, also collaborating on a new program and website for the Pediatric Resilience Program. So we're going to uh, talk about that shortly, too. But I thought we would first, just so people know, uh, that we have skin in the game. And I say that literally and figuratively, uh, since I've struggled with uh, weight and weight gain and loss through most of my life. Um, we have some really interesting connections why we arrived here doing this work. And I thought just briefly, we would share those connections so people understand we're not just coming at this from some cold clinical or academic uh, point of view, but this is very personal to us. Uh, so I'm going to start with um, Dr. Pashardi. Uh, you have you uh, started off life in India, and some something led you to going down the path of becoming a doctor and working in pediatrics and gastroenterology. So, would you share that story, please? Yeah, and for the rest of the conversation, Wolfram, I'm hoping you'll call me Uma because you know we are really dear friends. And so, yes, I'm a physician, but Wolfram calls me Uma and I love that more. <laughs> um, so I, I grew up actually in the Bay Area of California and then did medical training and lived in India for quite a number of years. And, and I grew up with that myth that it was all about the quantity of food that you ate and calories and struggled with that knowledge for myself, never was taught nutrition in medical school. I did though become a pediatric gastroenterologist because I was interested in nutrition, malnutrition of the classic sort in India, seeing true malnutrition, starvation, famine. And I liked learning about vitamins and minerals and all that. So I became a pediatric gastroenterologist because number one, I went into medical school to be a pediatrician. I love kids and gastroenterology because of the nutrition basis. But going into that thinking, it was all about micronutrients and calories and had no clue about what like Dr. Lustig has taught me about the quality of the food or what they have done to the food. Um, and I would counsel patients saying all these things that were totally wrong. Now I know about calories and macronutrients and you need so much protein and it doesn't matter what the source of those foods were just as much as much as you needed to check off some boxes. And so that is my background and having learned about Dr. Lustig and the foundation that you had started with him and understanding the biochemistry behind metabolic syndrome, largely from Dr. Lustig, you, Leslie, it's transformed the way I practice medicine now in Seattle. 
I love hearing that background. And Leslie, we share um, a bit, uh, some background geographically in that we both came from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And there's one, many wonderful things about the Midwest, but we also experienced some of the, uh, the uh, horrors of Midwestern food. Maybe you could share a little bit of your story and how you became, uh, why you became a registered dietitian. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So um, I, I was raised on the worst food imaginable. It was absolutely ultra processed junk food. And, and I'm not blaming my parents at all. We didn't know any better at the time. And both of my parents worked and they worked a lot and um, they're not natural chefs by any means. And so we were doing what tons of people were doing. And we simply didn't know any better because we too thought, um, the only thing that really mattered about diet were, were how many calories that you were eating. And, and if you had a problem with, with anything health related, weight gain or whatever, well, that was, you know, your own fault, right? <laughs> so, so we didn't know any better. And I, you know, subsided on, on fast food and chips and, and cookies and candy bars every single day and, and juice and, and really horrible stuff. And not surprisingly, I felt horrible every single day. I felt horrible. And, and, um, I was always gaining weight. If, if I wasn't trying to prevent weight gain, I was actively gaining and, um, you know, weight aside, I, I have this clear memory of sitting on the sofa as a child wanting to go outside and play. And I didn't have the energy to go outside and play. I couldn't live the, the childhood that I wanted for myself at that moment. All I could do was really binge on chips and, and cookies. And I felt tethered to the sofa. Like I didn't have enough energy to get up. Um, and I was uh, around 13, I was diagnosed with reactive hypoglycemia. And um, my doctor told me, you know, when you're experiencing hypoglycemia, you need to eat some, some fast carbohydrates to bring your blood sugar back up. He gave me some examples of that, like juice, crackers, you know, cookies, whatever. My 13 year old brain interpreted that as, you know, refined carbohydrates are health foods for me. Mm -hmm. So I went, I, I went harder with the ultra processed diet, to be quite honestly, I really dove into that. Um, and I thought pastries were health foods for me. And so I was, I was intentionally eating refined carbohydrate every three hours. And needless to say, I felt far worse when I did that. So um, I went off to college, still felt crummy day in and day out. It felt like to walk across the room, I was dragging cinder blocks behind me. And I, I knew this was not this was not what my baseline should be. And so I started doing my own uh, nutrition research. And then I realized that um, this is something that I'm, I'm, it's information I was desperate for, and I was intrinsically motivated to learn. So I uh, went to grad school for nutrition and I became a dietitian. And then um, you know, I, I worked in the field for a number of years and I still struggled with the exact same problem because I didn't realize that not all calories have the same metabolic effects on, on my body. And it wasn't until I stumbled upon a, an article that, uh, in, in which Rob Lustig was interviewed and, and he was talking about how not all calories are the same. Sugar has unique harmful effects on our bodies, metabolic effects on our bodies, um, that, that that make it hazardous and make it harmful for us. And, and that was a, a, a defining moment in my life. A light bulb went off and said, this is something practical I can work on right now. And I'm gonna see if it changes the way that I feel. And, and it did. And um, despite my, my proper nutrition education, you know, I, I learned this in a, in, in a pop culture article of some sort, I don't even remember, but uh, so, so that was really kind of the turning point in my journey. And, and that's when I realized the quality of the food matters. And um, I've been on this different trajectory ever since. Well, I really appreciate hearing the story. And I remember when I first met you, it was a job interview and mm -hmm. um, you, you had all the qualifications. There was like no doubt there, but once I heard your story and what you had, you know, the skin in the game, um, I like I didn't need to talk to anybody else. I just wanted to hire you right on the spot. So 
Um, it, was, it was meant to be, I think. Well, I'm, I, I'm saving the best for last year. Uh, Roberta, you also had your struggles and you've told your story many times on our blood sugar hotline of uh, the story that led you to found the organization. But I know that you this didn't uh, didn't just start later in life after you became a mother. You, had, you grew up in uh, New York City, Italian family. You know, what kind of food uh, stories kind of led you here, you know, uh, that you ultimately had to figure this out yourself. But some of those we early grew up, uh, a whole life re re resolved, we revolved around food. We have I have an Italian uh, heritage background and, you know, pasta and white flour and cake and cookies and pies. I mean, I remember as a little girl going back, I mean, my thing was Oreo, Oreos with um, cold milk. And I couldn't understand every time I had that I would get sick, but it just never dawned on me. There was never a connection between your symptoms and food. I mean, food was love. Mm -hmm. So that's what I grew, grew up on. And I was able, I guess, because I was young, that if I didn't feel good, I, I pushed and I went through it. So I went through, you know, grade school and I went through high school. But then at 17, I, I had no intentions of getting married or meeting someone until I met my husband. And that changed everything. And then here I was very young and um, I became pregnant right away. Mm -hmm. And I said to the doctor, you know, what should I eat? Do I have to eat anything special or anything? He says, oh, no, don't worry about it. And like after three months, I gained like 20 pounds. And I said, doctor, are you sure that it's okay? I mean, I'm eating all my food, which was, again, a lot of Italian food was pasta and lasagna and, you know, uh, bread and cakes, pies, pastry. And he says, don't worry about it. Uh, well, lo and behold, I gained 60 pounds during my pregnancy. And right after my daughter was born, that's when I started having symptoms. And I, I was so excited about having a baby, but I was so depressed. I was crying. I had severe headaches. I had insomnia. I had the shakes. I had uh, cold hands, cold feet. Now, I don't mean just cold hands, cold feet. I mean, where they had to be wrapped up. I felt I was fr frostbitten. So I would go to the doctor and he says, oh, it's just after baby blues, don't worry about it. Well, in a couple of months, I became pregnant again with my son and every symptom that I had with my daughter was intensified to a point where I couldn't function. And I would go back and never anything was discussed about what I was eating. And I just said, I cannot function and take care of two children that are 14 months apart. So that's when he introduced me to Valium. So long story short, it took five years and I went back and forth for tests because I had all of these symptoms and they were intensifying and nothing was physically wrong with every test that I took. So it had to be emotional. And that's when they said, see your first psychiatrist. Now you're talking about 1968. No one goes to a psychiatrist or at least spoke about it. So I went and he said, again, you got married too young, had children too soon. I said, what do I do? And then I started to be introduced to all the psychotic medication, Thorazine, Melaril, Tofranil. Um, and then I went to another psychiatrist and he said the same thing. Well, at this time, eight years have passed and I was ready to just give up. But the third doctor had an answer. He says, I have something uh, and it's been useful. And you know, at that time, medicine wasn't like today. You did not question the doctor. You put him on a pedestal and you just said, yes. So he has something and I says, whatever it is, I'll take it, I sign. And I did not realize that I was going to a mental hospital and have electric shock therapy. So when I came home after that, it was something that I never spoke about for almost 10 years and something that it was very hard to deal with and I was ready to give up. And then finally we moved to South Florida and with all the symptoms that I had, another symptom that I could not control, I was passing out. So I had no choice but to go to another doctor. And this one doctor said to me, what do you eat? And I said, oh my God, this diet is crazy. I wanted to run out. He says, no, I'm serious. What do you eat? And then I thought not only what I did eat, which was my mother would bring over pasta in the afternoon and, and, it, and she was excited and I was excited. It wasn't only what I was eating, it was, it was what I was not eating. 
because I would skip meals. I had two children to take care of. I would skip breakfast. I would skip lunch. Then I'd have the pasta or, or the bread or, or the ap hot apple pie. So um, he says, I'm going to take a, a glucose tolerance test. I have never had that test and all of the time. And he came back and he said, you have reactive hypoglycemia. And I says, what do I do? What's the medicine? He says, no, you need a diet. And I said, there's no way. There's no way. And it took me three years. I had no idea what a carb was. I didn't even know what a carbohydrate was. Simple, complex. I had no idea what vitamins I should take. I got sick with the ones I was taking. It was trial and error. Exercise. I lived in Brooklyn. It was the stoop and skating. I didn't exercise. So <laughs> it took a while and that was it. But there was a tiny little article, anyone having harmful effects of electric shock therapy, get in touch with this committee. And I did. And then it hit the newspapers. I did a lot of um, talk shows. And someone said, people need to hear your message. You have to start a support group. And I said, there's no way. But lo and behold, that's what they did 40 years ago. So it was 42 years ago. But I tried to get doctors. I wrote to 50 doctors in the area, not one answer. But we found the doctors, every Dr. Sharaskin, Dr. Harvey Ross, Dr. Carlton Fredericks. And we put on monthly uh, support groups for 25 years. Wow. And then there, when we found Lou from five, six years ago, he just took us to another level. And it's just, here we are. So um, we, I we just, here's our tribe. We're delighted because uh, we've, we've found doctors that listen, uh, like Uma, and, uh, and health professionals like Leslie. Um, and the point of telling these stories is that, um, again, th we don't approach this work from just uh, some sort of uh, remote uh, academic um, point of view. This is, this is personal, our health, own health and our own lives are on the line. And I, I have a similar background as Leslie. I was raised by a single working mom in the Midwest. And, you know, moms have to take shortcuts. And uh, my mom, you know, had to take her shortcuts too. It would be a pizza night or, you know, a TV dinner or something like that. Uh, she loved to cook and she, she uh, loved to put love in the food, but um, she was a single working mom. She had to take shortcuts. And so shortcuts mean processed food. And uh, so we all have these stories, but the good news is that uh, you've developed a really amazing model program at Swedish um, called Pediatric Resilience. And that's what we really want to focus on the rest of the call. Um, first of all, you know, please, for anybody who doesn't know, you know, what is pediatric gastroenterology? Um, you're in, a, in sort of a specialty area, and you might just explain um, not only what pediatric gastroenterology is, but how children end up at your clinic, uh, because I imagine they have to see their general care provider first before they get referred to you and then maybe some of the presenting conditions that are coming your way. Yeah, so pediatric gastroenterologist is a subspecialty within the field of pediatrics. So as I mentioned before, I went into medicine to be a pediatrician. And then within those three years you do after medical school of what we call residency training, I decided I wanted to sort of super specialize into one focused area and gastroenterology called to me because it is the specialty within pediatrics that focuses on nutrition. And then when I started practicing pediatric gastroenterology, what were the things I was charged with seeing on a daily basis? Well, the most common thing is kids just coming in of all ages from like, let's say two to 18, because you know pediatricians generally take care of newborns to the age of 18 with just chronic abdominal pain or constipation. So what are the more common things that I see today in my practice in Seattle? You know, kids with chronic abdominal pain, nausea, um, they don't feel hungry or they feel like they, they can't, you know, they feel constipated or they feel that their stools are too loose, just sort of general symptoms of the digestive tract. And I did this for a long time and started realizing most of these kids don't have an ultimate like diagnosis that I was taught in medical school. Like this isn't gonna end up being celiac disease or Crohn's disease or any of these things. And you look for all these diseases that you learned in the textbooks and you're like, but these kids don't have any of these things. And at the same time, they're not making up their symptoms. Something really doesn't make them feel good. Like Leslie was going through in her childhood. And time after time, I would, I'm gonna guesstimate somewhere in the 80 to 90% range of the kids that I see 
it's just their their diet, their food. They're not eating real food. And if you if you, I mean, this is the way I say it. And if, you know, if you put poison in your body and then you feel sick, it's not a disease. It's not an allergy. Your bodies are actually smarter than most kids. Your bodies are calling out to you to tell you something's not right. I'm not eating right. My my whole system is off. And I'm going to give you a symptom so that you go see a doctor to talk about this. But the problem is I'm not that traditional doctor, I think, because I cannot, I just can't put myself in the shoes of a doctor who puts kids on medication. I'm past that at this point. And I just would love to prevent this and treat it from a dietary holistic aspect. And so if, if a kid, I mean, why would a seven-year-old have heartburn? I, I see seven, eight, nine, ten-year-olds with heartburn and I just can't bring myself to put them on a heartburn blocker, acid blocker. I'm like, well, maybe it's something to do with your diet or the way you live or something about your sleep or something like that that's making you experience heartburn. You are experiencing heartburn, no question about it. No seven-year-olds making the stuff up. But it isn't really just, oh, let's put them on an acid blocker and call them a min miniature adult. Well, we all talked about our families and the family dynamics. And this is not about blaming the, our family for our you know, diet for our health and diet problems. You know, we, we you know, we've learned a lot in the last uh, 40 years about food and nutrition, and, and a lot of people are still learning. Um, and so I know that you, even if you, you've unlocked one of the big keys that obviously food and nutrition is fundamental, not just the conventional medicine, uh, you know, uh, uh, drugs, uh, devices, procedures, but looking at food, um, you, you can't just prescribe a diet to a kid. You have to speak to the whole family because mom's not just cooking and dad's not just cooking for one child. And it, I, I used to share the story. I don't share it anymore. Cause like I started getting the same response was, Oh, you know, when I was, uh, you know, 18, uh, 16, I think I became a vegetarian and my mom was very nice about it. And she would, every night there would be a vegetarian option and there would be a, a you know, a carnivore option. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was so cool. And I tell that story sometimes, and then moms look, kind of scoff at me. They go, oh, that's nothing. I have to prepare four different meals every night. You know, I have a vegan daughter and my husband's on paleo and I'm on the North Beach diet and my son just eats Frida, uh, you know, uh, Cheetos or whatever. <laughs> uh, so um, it must be complex. I mean, you, you can't just say, oh, here's the diet. And first of all, is there a book that has this magic diet in it? So what do you tell them? I mean, how do you talk to the family? Yeah, so th that is so true. And that is why Leslie works with me. So I didn't have a dietitian, even though I'm a gastroenterologist and I focus on nutrition until I hired Leslie, thank God. She, there was no dietitian in my clinic. And this was an uphill battle for me. It took me maybe 45 minutes just to explain what I thought to the family. And then it would take at least another 45 minutes to explain the fix, which is the nutrition part. And once Leslie came on board, now I, I just walk out and tell Leslie, go back in there because she takes care of the diet. I'm being a little flippant, but what I'm saying is it takes a team. One person can't do this. It takes many visits and, you know, a doctor can do their piece. And then a dietitian, a nutritionist, someone who understands the, the, the food part of this really does need to take that on. And that is why I'm so happy Leslie works with me. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to turn to, to Leslie. I want to hear what you, what you do, because I know it's more than just saying, just eat real food. Uh, you have to <laughs> that. But I'll just point out to Uma's point that, uh, less than 30% of medical doctors are required to take even one course in nutrition and the actual study of nutrition in medicine for most doctors is uh, still minimal. It's actually less than it was 40 years ago when the dietary guidelines were passed and the Congressional Act to do that actually specified that a study be conducted nationally of why medical schools in the U.S., don't teach nutrition to doctors. And that was never implemented. And here we are 40 years later, and the number is actually lower than it was then. So you're very lucky to have uh, Leslie, and I'll just turn it over to Leslie now and say, you know, what do you do? This can't be easy. It is, it is definitely not easy. And, you know, our, our message, you know, we can simplify the message down to just eat real food. But but applying that in real life is, is quite difficult because um, every family is, is starting at their own baseline. And to your point, Wolfram, there, there may be four different diets in the family, but um, 
even more likely than that, it's four different picky eaters in the family and everybody has their own requirements. You know, so this kid eats this thing and not this thing and that kid eats, you know, that thing, but not that thing. And even the parents are picky eaters, quite honestly, even parents are picky eaters. Um, so, so that is the first challenge. And so um, I always, it, it helps tremendously when Uma has seen them and she has explained um, that ultra processed foods are, are poison. And uh, I encourage her to use that term because when that's coming from your doctor, it, it, it um, conveys a, a lot of significance to families. If, I, if I'm seeing a family and they haven't seen Uma and they haven't heard that message and perhaps I tell them, um, it's just not nearly as convincing as when Uma does. Mm -hmm. so, so that is uh, a, an advantage that I have. Um, and then um, we start with just eat real food and then usually the families go through, well, well what about this? And what about this? And what, you know, like, I say you need a source of fiber with every meal and every snack. And I explain, you know, non-starchy vegetables are sources of fiber and fruits are sources of fiber and beans and lentils and nuts and seeds. So you need one of those present in every meal or snack. And so then I get the questions of, and what about smoothies, for example? Um, and so we really have to work through all of these these real life questions that that families have about implementing the the simple message of of just eat real food and and for the record the smoothies are not real food because you are processing the food the blender is far more efficient at destroying the insoluble fiber in plants than your digestive system is um, and and uh, the moral of the story, we, we want to eat foods with their fiber intact. So I, I want families to eat their fruits and vegetables, not uh, blend them up and drink them. But um, it, uh, a, a, another thing I, I do, Wolfram, it's especially because I'm working with the pediatric population and, and the kid is not always ready for these changes that their doctor and, and their parents and myself are trying to force upon them. Um, so I'm not expecting perfection out of kids. I'm not expecting perfection out of parents. I really take a harm reduction approach where, you know, we're, we're swapping this food out for, for something else that's a little more real food that's got some intact fiber. Um, and, and I see them over and over again, and we keep making substitutions like that to, to get to a better place over time. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I, it, it's a... Uh... The process and we're all learning together. I think that's really important. And you're creating this sense of community around this, which I think is uh, really special because um, even now, now I'm, you know, I'm in my 60s. And when I go to the doctor, I still feel like a little kid sitting there in the chair. And I, my mind goes blank. I, I was like, the doctor, the doctor, you know, um, I'm just, I, so I always take a list with me and I pull out my crazy list. It's a whole page of things, you know, little notes that I made because I'm afraid that I'll, my mind will go blank and it always does when I'm sitting there in the doctor's office because she's there, she comes in, she's uh, already, she's rushing because she's going from one page to the next. She sits down at the computer and she's pulling up my chart on the screen. And I'm like, oh, what's next? I'm like, is it uh, time for that annual exam? You know, and I'm just stressed <laughs> out, you know. <laughs> Tell me what exam that is, but you know, I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, and my brain. Well, so for me, I have to have that, um, you know, that list in front of me, and um, and it's just like it's all about like the doctor and you know what's you know am I going to get a medication? Am I going to get a diagnosis? But you're going beyond that with the with the pediatric resilience program and reaching beyond the clinic to the community. And so maybe you could talk about some of the pieces of what the pediatric resilience program is that you're building. And you're going beyond the community too. You're going to the doctors with the annual, you know, with the CME conferences. So just, if you could just share a little bit, like what, first of all, why resilience? What does that have to do? You know, what is resilience? Maybe you could explain that and then just explain how you're building community around your program. Right. So, you know, I go, go back as far as, I told you I didn't have a dietitian and it wasn't because I couldn't find one. It was that I didn't want a dietitian in the name of a dietitian that counted calories and 
plug numbers into a calculator. I can do that on my own. And I waited to find the right dietitian. And, you know, Leslie was that person. She got it. She gets it. She's not just following some textbook example. She understands the quality of the food and the metabolism and the biochemistry. So it's always been my interest to do this right if I was going to do it. And so what I've found is that you need a community support. You need multiple layers of this you know, in, 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 in sort of to work together. And I named it resilience because I thought, okay, this isn't just gastroenterology. This isn't just nutrition. This isn't just lifestyle, but it's sort of a combination of all of this. And when I put those words in my head, like I want to prevent this disease, I want to educate, I want to talk about lifestyle and sleep and nutrition and diet. The word resilience came out of that because first of all, I could take the letters of all those individual words, but also resilience spoke to my heart because at the end of it, that is what I think mostly about children. They are so resilient. You, you, can, uh, you can do a lot of things to a child and somehow their amazing little bodies and minds and brains just come back and they, they pop back. And so it's our job to just sort of guide them to the right path and make sure that we don't, you know, at least harm them while we're trying to help them. And so um, resilience was named really out of the, the passion that I have about kids just being able to take care of themselves as long as we don't mess them up along the way. Mm-hmm. Well, I, again, I think it's remarkable because you're looking at, uh, you're, you're not just looking, diagnosing what's wrong with the child or with the family, but you're, you're really diagnosing strengths. You know, you're looking for strengths. And, uh, you know, I have to say, I mean, a lot of doctors just don't have the time. I mean, they're in institutions where they're given, you know, 15, 20 minutes to see a patient. And um, they really just have to check off the boxes and go to the next one, you know. And so it takes some effort. Dr. Lustig went through this as well. Uh, he, he's a pediatric neuroendocrinologist, but the same kind of situation where he's at the end of the line, he's a, he's a specialty uh, doctor and kids who are already uh, sick are coming to his clinic and he wanted to get out in front. You know, you talk about this on the, on the website that's being developed is this idea of going upstream. Uh, and there's a parable about the, you know, uh, about what's coming downstream, going upstream and looking for the problem. Um, but he wanted to, he didn't want the kids to come to his clinic to begin with. He wanted to uh, get involved with preventive health and help educate uh, children and their families. And so, you know, he gave a lecture and he, of course he's focused a lot on sugar. Um, but, you know, this idea of going upstream and, and education, and you have, it's very hard because you, you have to reach out in the community. You have to learn how to communicate medicine and science in terms that everybody can understand. Um, and it's become especially important now during the, uh, this pandemic, uh, which doesn't seem to go away. Um, but what we are learning as stories are emerging out of this is that um, our resilience, our ability to survive COVID-19 um, have a lot to do with our metabolic status. And uh, we've also seen some disturbing reports that during the pandemic, uh, rates of type 2 diabetes and obesity have been skyrocketing in children. And so at a time when we really need to be healthier metabolically speaking, we're actually seeing a decline. Maybe you could uh, talk about that a little bit and you know, what, what, can, you know, what do parents need to be thinking about? I think we can all get the virus, uh, you know, we, we get the vaccination that gives us some protection, but what are the other protections that we can look for? Yeah, uh, so going back also, I forgot to answer the first part of your question, which was what are the aspects of the resilience program? So there's really sort of four tenants yeah. What, what Leslie and I have been already doing for several years together, taking one child at a time and treating them in our clinic, we've been able, yes, and Swedish is a wonderful hospital. I work at Swedish Medical Center in Seattle, and they've been able to get me support. We now have an, a pediatric endocrinologist. We have a health coach. We have a nurse. Um, we, we have a whole team that's seeing these children one at a time with each referral. And I, I, I'm not a primary care pediatrician. So right, a, a pediatrician has to see these children and then they have to be referred into our program. But like, like Dr. Lustig, I would love nothing more than for this resilience program to implode upon itself because people get it. 
And then we don't have to have this problem. Metabolic syndrome in children was never a thing when I was a child. No child had type 2 diabetes in 1972, which was the year I was born in. This was caused by the ultra processed food industry. And so if we get the word out there, whether it's through resilience or these types of webinars, and one day people get it and and reject that and you know metabolic syndrome goes away, that would make me the happiest person on earth. Um, so there are other four, three components of resilience are to get out there and teach the primary care pediatricians and other family practice doctors and nurses and everybody who wants to learn about what this is, why I'm passionate about it, why Leslie is doing what she's doing. And then you don't need us, you can do it on your own, you can prevent this, you can teach you know, pregnant mothers what to do in their diet to prevent their newborn child from ever having to see a specialty group like us. And then there's a, a part where I know that there's gonna be families that can't travel to Seattle or international people who wanna learn about this. So we're, we're designing a, an amazing, hopefully amazing website that can teach you to do what we're doing, what we're passionate about. And then the fourth part of this is that, you know, there's a saying that you can only cook yourself out of this mess. If you don't, you know, if you, if you can't use the poison that you're buying in the stores that cause this disease, you're gonna have to learn to cook your own food. And there's a lot of families that need help with that. And, 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 I, and I was there and I didn't share my own personal story, but I too have struggled with weight my whole life and cutting calories was never doing it until I learned just to eat real food. It was a struggle for me. I used to be a sugar holic. I used to be addicted to sugar. I used to eat cheesecake for breakfast. <laughs> and so, you know, I get it. And so until I started understanding that I have to learn how to cook and I have to eat more fiber, I could have never fixed this problem for myself. So knowing the importance of how to cook is something that I would like to share and impart upon the families and patients that come to see me. So that's the fourth part. We will be holding classes. We've already done a couple of these and live streaming them and recording them so that you can understand how to cook we can teach you doctors and nurses and dietitians in Swedish are going to teach children and families how to cook. So that's the fourth part of this program. Um, and then uh, I'm so lost. I forgot what the question was now. <laughs> I forgot too. I just I love listening to you. And Resilience I against COVID. Yeah. 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 yeah so I, mean, I think it's twice doubled now the, uh, uh, the uh, incidence of type 2 diabetes. In the time of the 18 months we've been under lockdown, children have now doubled their incidence of type 2 diabetes. And that does not happen because they're not outside playing. Uh -huh. That's what everybody thinks, but it's more to do with what they're eating when they're inside. And, you know, they're eating more comfort food, they're eating more processed foods. And we've seen a lot of, of poor dietary habits, unfortunately, sort of cement in this increase in type 2 diabetes. And I would, so all of, all of that's absolutely true, but the other additional elements on our, our kids through this pandemic is that number one, they were home for so long and they were bored. Mm -hmm. And then number two, many of them are stressed out by this pandemic. You know, anxiety is skyrocketing as well. And um, kids don't naturally know how to productively cope with anxiety. Well, honestly, adults don't always either. We need help building those coping skills and um, so you've got uh, kids cooped up, they're bored, they might be stressed, they might be anxious, um, plus uh, an addicting ultra processed food environment and um, yeah, the that metabolic health has, has gone awry even <laughs> <laughs> far, far worse during this pandemic. Well, and it's so important to catch these problems early in life. Um, you know, in the last 40 years, as Uma mentioned, there's been a transformation in the U.S. about metabolic health in children. I, back in the early 80s, uh, when I started my career, actually in the late 70s, I have to admit, um, one of my, my second job in social change work was working in a preventive health care uh, center for seniors. And at that time, um, type 2 diabetes was called geriatric diabetes. Uh, and basically, it was just a problem that older folks had later in life. Um, there's always been a maybe gestational diabetes, a, a kind of a temporary manifestation of uh, diabetes during um, you know, um, pregnancy. But basically, this was an old, uh, a disease that uh, older folks had. And the onset of type two has dropped down, you know, steadily in the last 40 years. And Dr. Lefsky, and I'm sure you've seen children very young, 
uh, being diagnosed with the condition. Um, Leslie, you worked on a questionnaire with uh, uh, Roberta and the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation. And it was a really interesting um, sort of analysis that you came out of, um, you know, sort of having to do with looking upstream. But Roberta, would you maybe you have, I think you have a, the, this paragraph handy uh, to describe what Leslie, uh, her analysis, we've, we've actually surveyed uh, over 2,300 folks. And it was really interesting to hear what emerged out of that. 40% of the people um, had hypoglycemia who responded and 40% of those who had hypoglycemia weren't diagnosed by a doctor. They had to look beyond their medical doctor for a diagnosis. And we've heard at least two people on this call who had to find out about reactive hypoglycemia pretty much on their own. Do you want to read that paragraph? Because it's kind of... Yes. Uh, um, the, the whole interview was was great. Um, we read it last night, but we knew we didn't have time to go over it. But I think uh, something like 2,200 people, 22, yeah, 2,200 people responded. Um, and what I asked you, and this was your response, what was the most startling conclusion of the new questionnaire? Because previously, about 10 years ago, we did the first questionnaire. And this was your response. And it's just perfect and it's perfect to read here. Give me one minute. There were many interesting conclusions. The most important result to me was what we learned about reactive hypoglycemia preceding the development of type two diabetes. Two thirds of our respondents who have been diagnosed with type two diabetes or pre-diabetes reported that they experienced hypoglycemia before their diabetes diagnosis. Most of them, 85% experienced hypoglycemia two or more years before their diabetes diagnosis, which to me represents a very clear window of opportunity for education and diet improvement. And, you know, that was so powerful what you said that, um, you know, I, I had to bring it up today. So my question is, do you see that in your... Do you see that as a red flag in the children that you're dealing yes. with? Because yes. what's alarming, I would say in the last four months, we have had a huge amount of parents who have teenagers between the age of four, 12 and 14 years old, severely hypoglycemic and mm -hmm. going through exactly what you've been talking about. So can you help us add or add to that, Leslie? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, so yes, many of the kids, who, who we are seeing with metabolic syndrome, um, they are experiencing reactive hypoglycemia. And, and um, to kind of clarify what that means, essentially they're eating an ultra processed diet, very high in refined carbohydrate. They eat this huge bolus of refined carbohydrate. They get a giant influx in glucose in their bloodstream and then a very large uh, insulin response. So the pancreas releases insulin to bring that blood sugar back down to normal. But what's abnormal about that process is the amount of glucose and the time in which it entered the bloodstream, which is, which is to say quite quickly, and then the amount of insulin that is released. So, so it's, it's too much insulin and this is happening every two hours throughout the day on repeat every every day of this child's life and it's that dysfunction this this state of hyperinsulinemia all that insulin does its job far too well brings the blood sugar down to a, a crashing low that is reactive hypoglycemia um, when you're in that low you're going to be your body's going to tell you eat 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 um it, it's completely irrational. You're not going to be able to stand in front of the refrigerator and be like, oh, let me warm up those that nutritious uh, leftovers from last night. You're going to go to the cereal box and pour it down your throat. Um, and then you're just going to continue that cycle of um, um, refined carbohydrate and a high insulin response. And over time, that's going to become quite taxing on your pancreas. And um, when your pancreas gets worn out, you, you can't produce enough insulin to control your blood sugar, and that is type 2 diabetes. And so um, the kids we see with metabolic syndrome, they're, they're somewhere on, on their path. They're somewhere in the middle. And that's what I was experiencing as the child who 
couldn't get themselves off the sofa to go play outside like they wanted to go play. That That's where I was. Um, so yeah, we see it every day. And I see it. I mean, kids fill out a little form when they come as a referring referred patient to me. And often I see parents have written fatigue, fatigue, nausea, no energy, poor sleep, brain fog. These are the things, and I'm a gastroenterologist and I'm often think I used to think in my previous life before I got it, why are these kids seeing me? I'm a gastroenterologist. I, I can't fix brain fog, but now I, I clued into those are the problems from diet that may also be the reason that the same child has heartburn. Well, and number that, one, number one symptom uh, on the, the questionnaire that you worked on together, number one system, uh, symptom fatigue. Yeah. yeah. Fatigue. And, yeah. and that, that same child Uma just described, their parents are also going to tell me they're always hungry and they eat huge portions of, of carbohydrate. And yeah. that's, that's hypoglycemia. And their yeah. sleep is off. Just, I'm so sorry. Yep. But, you know, if you understand the biochemistry and how insulin, you know, uh, controls melatonin and all that, you'll hear that these kids don't wake up till middle of the afternoon. And yeah. I will see some of these kids at 3 4 PM. And I'll ask them, what have you eaten today? Well, they literally woke out of bed half an hour before this visit, haven't eaten a thing. And then what they go do at, or starting at like 8, 9 p.m. is start eating all these ultra processed foods and carbs. And then they're up half the night and their sleep cycle is reversed. And you know, it's all due to this insulin surge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been hearing a lot of this. Uh, the kids won't get up and, and, the, and parents have to go in and just take them out of bed and force them to get out of bed. Uh, but we, we, you know, let's talk about breakfast. I mean, Uma, you got uh, juice off the pediatric menu at, at Swedish and some people listening now go juice. Wh- why can't I give juice to my kid? What's wrong with juice? And uh, Leslie brought up the cereal box. So what's wrong with cereal? You know, uh, please tell us, you know, why did you get juice off the pediatric menu? And Leslie, what's wrong with the cereal box? That was a sacred thing in the Midwest, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I ate a ton of it. Yeah, so the, the unifying thing to, that causes cereal to be bad for us and juice is the lack of fiber, real fiber. So there's, you know, fiber in whole intact grains and there's fiber in fruit. But as soon as you process those, blenderize them, you've destroyed the fiber. And it's that fiber structure that protects us from the harm of all of these um, carbohydrate containing foods, and it protects us from having this insulin spike. Mm-hmm. Well, Leslie, yeah, we, we don't give them juice and cereal. What do we give them for breakfast? <laughs> people, get tired. people get tired of hear, hearing me say it, but eggs, give them eggs and vegetables. I am such a huge proponent of eating vegetables at breakfast and nobody takes me seriously on this, but I feel amazing when I eat eggs and vegetables for breakfast. And I want everybody doing that. Um, If that's not your jam, you know, a banana and peanut butter or almond butter, so long as it's not the type with added sugar or or apple with those two things, either of those two things. And and here in the Pacific Northwest, we're coming off of summer, but there was just an abundance of beautiful fresh berries, Mm -hmm. um, berries and plain yogurt or something, Mm -hmm. you know, fiber. Fiber is the best thing you can do for yourself in the morning with every meal, in fact. Yep. So forget about the cereal box. Don't buy it. Don't buy and it. And the no. juice boxes. Boy, the juice boxes, they're everywhere. Oh, yeah, they, they are yeah. everywhere. And uh, <laughs> I've said this to Uma one time, you know, I don't have a drink budget at all. I mean, I, I pay the city of Seattle for, for the water entering our home. And I, I guess we do buy some water filters, you know, for a pitcher, but other than that, I don't have a, a drink budget and, and neither should our, the families we work with just drink water, just drink water. And don't tell me you don't like water. You have to get used to it. Your body requires water. <laughs> you can throw some things in that water. I mean, uh, I, some, you can make tea. There's all kinds of teas. This is like a, uh, like an explosion of teas. And now that these uh, basically low or no calorie fruit flavored beverages are basically spa water. Some of it's bubbly, some of it's not, but it's so easy to sort of spice up the water if you need to and make it more palatable for kids, I think. Yeah, well, you have kids who 
are having a struggle getting used to the taste of water for heaven's sakes. And so we, we have to sort of wean them off of these sugared beverages or juices. And one of the things we'll do is just have them chop up some fruit and put it at the bottom of the water bottle and then let that infuse into their own water bottle all day. And then they get some sort of strawberry flavor or some lemon flavor, cucumber flavor, things like that. Well, uh, sugar is the other big kahuna. And, and uh, I think there's often a lot of uh, confusion about dietary sugar and then uh, blood sugar or blood glucose. Um, but we do know that, you know, if you're on juice and cereals, you know, you're going to be on this blood sugar roller coaster. For those uh, who may not know, hypoglycemia is low blood sugar. And, um, you know, this is the blood sugar hotline. And so we talk a lot about blood sugar, but um, we don't just talk about low blood sugar because you almost never have a situation where you just have low blood sugar. There's always this roller coaster effect. And I used to be on that roller coaster diet. And I, I used to love breakfast cereal. And even I was on the, uh, you know, I gradually moved to the healthy, you know, the organic uh, blue corn, whatever uh, cereal, the, the even no, no added sugar cereal, but I was still getting processed grains and getting a big bolus of glucose, as Leslie said. And a couple hours later, I was crashing. And then I was looking for caffeine or looking for, uh, you know, a bagel or something, and I couldn't get, I couldn't make it to lunch without um, more carbohydrate. And that's what happens, you know, in a later stage, of course, is you're, you're insulin resistant and your body's just no longer able to uh, metabolize the sugar that you're ingesting, whether it's added sugar or from processed foods. And you just end up on that horrible roller coaster and it's a, it's a bit of a nightmare. So, well, for a similar thing here, so, I'd say cereal was my um, original breakfast, and then that transformed to the, you know, the more granola-like stuff. And then, then I, I thought I was doing something good for myself, and I said, I'm going to make stovetop oats every day. I'm, I'm getting, you know, whole grain oats. These are these are good for me. Even my profession is always saying eat more whole grains. I felt horrible after oats. I was known at that time for, for, oh, here's Leslie with her second breakfast of the day because I'd eat breakfast at 6.30 by 9.30. I couldn't, I couldn't cope. I had to have another breakfast at 9.30 and, and I was ravenous. I could not focus. Like um, there was no pushing through it. I, I had to eat, and that wasn't true hunger. That was a reaction to the oats that I had earlier in the day. And so, uh, what I have learned through that is, I'm not an oat person. You know, I you know I I think I have these tendencies for for metabolic syndrome. Um, I think I produce too much insulin in response to oats. That's not the right breakfast food for me. And that's how eventually I landed on, on eggs and, and vegetables. I was listening to my own body's feedback and, and that's how I got there. But I was literally known for having to have a second breakfast every single day because I was reacting to oats. Yeah, and speaking to what Leslie just said, like there's a lot of things that I have to do special now because I'm almost 50 years old and I didn't get this maybe until the last 10 years ago. And I would love to not have a child have to do what I have to do. You know, like if, if I can fix this or prevent this because children are so resilient, uh -huh. they may not have to watch what they eat and, you know, do as much work as maybe I still have to do into my forties and fifties because they can fix this before it becomes such a chronic issue. Yeah. Well, I guess that's why we're all here. I mean, we were very concerned at the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation about the flood of parents and children that seem to be affected by metabolic conditions, including blood sugar. Um, you're starting this program on resilience because you want to get out in front of this problem and not wait till kids show up at your clinic, already been referred by another doctor. And, um, and to help us cook our way out of this. So I, I, we're involved with building your website and we're, we're gonna have a robust section on recipes um, because uh, we know we just can't just preach our way out or educate our way out of this. We have to cook our way out of this. And it can actually be a lot of fun. I mean, uh, on the upside of my childhood, my mom, um, we had to start cooking for ourselves. I started cooking at age seven, my sister, She's two years younger than me, but four years smarter. So she started cooking when she was five. <laughs> and uh, we just had to cook. 
And, you know, it wasn't always the healthiest stuff, but we still had to cook. And so cooking as a family can be fun and teaching children how to cook. I've, I've been able to develop a number of programs for children and cooking outdoor kitchens and all kinds of kids just, uh, they, if you ask them to help and be part of it, they just love this. And it's, it doesn't have to be all about mom and dad. You know, uh, you can teach uh, young kids cooking skills from a young age and there's safety knives for kids and you know uh, ways that you can adapt your kitchen so you can have the kids there helping to make dinner and it's so important because that's the best time to educate them um, you know in the garden in the kitchen uh, but not in the classroom with a chalkboard and talking about macronutrients and micronutrients they won't get it there but if you if they have some uh, you know, a turnip or a kohlrabi in front of them, um, and they'll just stick it in their mouth, but they wouldn't touch <laughs> it you know, otherwise. You, you know, <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's true. So we're almost at the top of the hour, and um, I think we could spend easily another uh, couple hours. We didn't even begin to talk about healthy fats and protein. Well, we talked about eggs, uh, mm -hmm. but of course, there's a lot of uh, uh, protein options, and so maybe our next chat we can get into more of the uh, solutions and the cooking, uh, the fun part of it. Well, uh, but yeah. it's been a delight and I'll just leave it up to you and any closing comments or things you wanna say, each of you. Um, Roberta, what? I'll let you go first because you've been, uh, you've been very patient. Um, I know you've had, a, you, you're very concerned about children and we have a whole section on our website just for kids. Anything you wanna say before we close? Right, I am. I am concerned about children because with the COVID, uh, it's not only the diet, they're isolated. So I hear from the parents, not only are they tired and have all the symptoms that you're talking about, but they'll lock themselves in their rooms with a hoodie over their head and thoughts of suicide. So this is really, really serious. So I am indebted to you, uh, Dr. Pashadi and Leslie for starting this resilience program, because I think once it's up, it'll play a major role to the, our uh, HSF community and for you, Wolfram, for leading us and guiding us and putting it together. And, um, you know, I don't care if we have to work. The other night we did until 10 o'clock finishing up the website. It's just a delight because of, we're working with our tribe. So um, I feel very, very blessed and very excited and can't wait until it gets up. So that's what I want to say is thank you. We're going to let Uma have the last word. So Leslie, anything? <laughs> you wanna... I just want to share with any anyone listening, um, you should not wait until you or your child has metabolic syndrome to care about this. You you might think you're doing just fine. And with your, you know, maybe you have a, a daily treat, a daily indulgence every single day. No, you should care about the quality of food that you're eating. Everyone should just eat real food. Um, and I, I do recognize that that might be an oversimplification for people wondering where do we start? Um, but just like each one of us, um, you should begin. And, and, you know, you can certainly ask your doctor questions, but I think what you, you may have heard from, from each of us is that it might involve some some homework on your own and, and some digging and some exploration. And um, the four of us are, are building resources for, for all of you. And so um, begin, begin now. Don't wait for metabolic syndrome before you care. Now I'll, I'll just close by, you know, giving a shout out again to Dr. Robert Lustig, who's really the reason the four of us are working together. He was our inspiration and continues to mentor all of us. And the, you know, one of the best quotes from his latest book, Metabolical, is all of these conditions with the four of us have been talking about, they are not druggable. They are all foodable. And let food really be thy medicine. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, it's just a joy to uh, spend time with you all. I can't wait to see you in person. Uh, we have, we're planning a, an amazing continuing medical education conference. Uh, next June in 2022, and we are working hard to make it available, not just to healthcare professionals, but to the general public. Uh, so there are more on that to come. Uh, the Pediatric Resilience website will be up soon, and we'll post that. Uh, and on the there's a Facebook page that's already live, and uh, we'll, the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation will be sharing news. And of course, we're going to cross post on uh, Dr. Lustig's channel too. And we're, we're not only excited about this program 
uh, flourishing in Seattle, but the, the website so that we can share the news around the world. And I'm already uh, pitching the idea that we replicate your program. I know you're just getting started, but I know what's what you're going to do is just going to be amazing. Uh, we need programs like yours all around the world. I'm working in the Middle East, and the problems are incredible there. I'm currently on public health assignment here in southern uh, Mexico, and uh, the average consumption here of Coca-Cola is over 2.2 liters per day. So we have a, a, a whole planet of um, problems to solve, and I'm just so proud and delighted to know that you're uh, doing what you're doing in Seattle and setting an example, not just for patients and their families, but also for um, doctors and healthcare professionals around the world. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you all. You as well. Well, from yeah. Roberta, we're, we're all doing, fighting the good fight, I think. Thank you. Love you all. Love all you right. too. Bye. 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 Bye.